conference in Europe on September the 15th on the Eurasian Land Bridge, the Bering Straits Tunnel, and so forth. And for that, I believe for that, or something related to this, he's written a paper which just got put on the website, for those of you who like to keep up with these things. Um, what did I just do here? And it's entitled, I'm just trying to find the title page. Um, yeah. Music and Statecraft, How Space is Organized. Now, I'm just going to pick one thing. I'm not, I, I've only just, uh, I haven't finished the paper. I've read through some of it, most of it. But the, um, you know, think of the title. Music and Statecraft, How Space is Organized. And, uh, but I want to read one section because that's going to have to do with more what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is where it is, is a particular point about where we are in history, and one of the reasons that people are confused, because they don't know history, because you've been wrenched out of history, and I find that people have a tremendously difficult time relocating themselves. That, you know, they kind of try to locate themselves in history by saying, well, I live, I see a house across the street, you know, my, my parents were born in 1952, and I lived in this town and I knew these people and I remember some political event <laughs> and uh, that's their view that's history history is what happened to me history is what I got on the internet okay <laughs> you know this is the problem you know people you know th th there's this oh, I'll come back to this in a minute but anyway um, so and then there's also a sense that politics is cruddy and practical. Okay, and this is also, by the way, how uh, a great deal of slander is developed against the United States, or at least certain better parts of the United States. Because in a funny sense, the United States is a, a very different country. <clears throat> it's a very unique place. It doesn't mean it's the best place, or that we are chauvinists, but it's a very unique place. And, uh, you know, as, as Lynn has identified it, more, more specifically than anyone. But Lynn is, in one sense, in the American intellectual tradition, which might seem like a contradiction. American intellectual, how, how could that be? Well, in one sense, it's because the, Lynn comes out of a European tradition, the tradition of Western civilization, which was exported to the United States, to found the United States, because the historic mission of creating a republic could not be done in oligarchically dominated Europe. It can only be exported to the United States and then re-imported to Europe, a re-importation that never quite succeeded. But the, 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 the United States is a very unique place. And maybe that's one of the themes I want to make. And then when you, can, when you can locate yourself in history, you can find something out. That's a really, at one point I'll make a simple little polemic, that, you know, what, 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 what's happening as we face a, a great financial and political crisis is people keep going, and, uh, going out and talking to somebody, and they say, well, how can you do that? How can you? You can't put the banks into reorganization. You can't do this. Well, the fact is we've done it. <laughs> we did it really more than once. We did it every time we put the country on the right track. We did it at the founding of the country when Alexander Hamilton, after the failure of the Articles of Confederacy, was the leading organizer, one of the leading organizers of the Constitutional Convention and then proceeded to identify the basis for the economic development of a continental nation, a mission that was carried out by people like John Quincy Adams and Abraham Lincoln. We did it when Lincoln, faced with the Civil War, reorganized the Union, 
led the emancipation of the slaves, created a national currency, which didn't exist, and organized the infrastructural development of the continental United States. We did it when Franklin Roosevelt, on the day he was inaugurated, or the next day, put the entire U.S. banking system under a federal reorganization and shut down the banks. We've done all these things. It's in the Constitution. So how is it that everybody gets so shaken up with it? You know, Alan Greenspan said you can't do this. <laughs> he said it's in the banker's handbook. And that, that overrides the Constitution, because we've got the money. What makes bankers power? we got the money. You don't have the money. We have the money. And most uh, Americans don't say to somebody, Greenspan, you know, Greenspan, read Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. You don't have the money. We run the money. And the money doesn't run the world. Now, I want to read something real quick, just to give you a sense of this question, what I'm going to get to, uh, the unique character. Bach's Space, Time, and Ours. That's a subhead. Lest you might have forgotten, I caution you as you read on, that this, see, I'm giving the paper away, that this is not a treatise on music, but on the subject of certain little-known, higher functions of the individual human mind partly as the mind of an individual, but also as the specifically social dynamic characteristics that mind has also acquired as a social phenomena, phenomenon and as a political phenomenon, as during a relevant particular choice of time, place, and other circumstance, especially in this time of a nation and wider world in crisis. Although this is not a treatise on music, Truly classical music has played a crucial integral role in the healthy, moral, and related development in the individual's and society's power to think during the best intervals of modern European civilization. In this report, my included necessary recurring emphasis on music and classical poetry lies in the phase spatial function expressed by what Plato, Socrates, and the Christian apostles John and Paul emphasized with the same meaning as the great constitutional principle of truly civilized peoples known as agape. That is the same agape, the enemy of usury, which served as the principle of the great 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, and the principle, the pursuit of happiness. The same principle restated as the preamble of our federal constitution. This report, therefore, continues to touch here repeatedly and necessarily on the common topic of classical modes of poetry and music. But the subject of this piece as a whole remains statecraft. Now, I think, uh, you know, that's a little complicated, but <coughs> there's a point here. As Schiller puts it, the greatest form of art, the greatest art, the greatest heights of human freedom is statecraft. Now, that's a whole different idea of politics, I think. Because statecraft, politics, is the, is the development of the individual human mind in concert with other human minds to make the necessary discoveries and to communicate them as a form of social practice that allows for the ongoing development of the totality and the increasing totality of the human species. That is, in a sense, our mission. Oops. Um, that is the mission, and, and it, that's what, in part, I'm going to get to, makes the United States, that's what's unique about the United States. It's not that we're unique in the sense that we've succeeded in doing everything or we're better. It's unique in that we have a unique purpose. We're unique as a nation in the way we've been formed. 
you know, for, for the most part, except for sectional parts of the country, and, you know, we're not a nation that is bound to the soil. We're not a nation that's, at least in, in terms of our major traditions now, we could be subverted. And, we, and I would say that there are, there's one exception to this. We're not a nation that's a nation of blood and soil. We may uh, talk about the great resources, you know, the, the, the continental nation and so forth, but you don't really often get too much of this kind of the beautiful Mother Earth of the United States, the great soil in which we're embedded and out of which we've grown for thousands of years and so on and so forth. We don't have that much of that in us. There may be little smatterings of it. But if you've ever been to places like uh, Russia or Europe, you find, or the Middle Kingdom in China, you find a kind of uh, a mystical bond to the country, to the land, to sometimes what seems to be an unending uh, uh, genealogical chart that binds everybody in the nation. You know, you have funny situations like, you know, um, this comes up, but you, 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 there are whole sections of a place like China where everybody, you know, there's four last names that cover the whole place, or, you know, certainly large chunks of people. You know, it, one place where you find the same thing in, in North America is Quebec, because you, you have a French-Canadian separatism, and, it, you know, it has, it, there, there's reasons for it, but there's also a cer certain functional cutting off from the rest of the continent. Now think about it. The, what's the mission of the United States? The mission of the United States was to become the first republic. In other words, our mission was to accomplish a certain political form. To be able, and the reason we became a continental nation was to make that possible, not the other way around. If you read Quincy Adams, his point was to be able to secure ourselves from the uh, penetration of European oligarchies. We had to be able to secure the main borders, the two coasts, and, we, and the long borders with Mexico and Canada, with whom Quincy Adams, as Roosevelt and others, uh, sought some ongoing reasonable relationship. And if you take the case of Lincoln, he was the main opponent of the Mexican-American War. He was the main spokesman from the floor of the Congress against Polk and against this, what, what supposedly provoked the war, his famous spot speech, which was somewhat orchestrated by Quincy Adams, where Lincoln said, show me the spot where the Mexican forces attacked the American forces on American land. You can't show me because it didn't happen. And he was vilified for this. You know, uh, Lincoln was a one-term congressman. And one of the reasons, partly there was a tradition of not staying in, maybe maybe one or two or three terms at the most. Um, and there was actually a rotation in, in Illinois. Uh, but also he was accused of undermining the American forces in Mexico during the Mexican-American War. And you, it's, it's interesting because people would say, well, isn't that a contradiction? Because weren't they uh, expansionists? Didn't they want California and New Mexico and so on and so forth? And Lincoln's view was very simple. Lincoln's view, as was the view of Quincy Adams, was that would happen by normal peaceful procedures, either by some kind of an agreement between Mexico and the United States or even some form of alliance, federation, et cetera, et cetera. And that war was not the way to do it. So they had, a, they had the idea of a continental nation. But the essence of it was a republic. If you, look, if you read the Federalist Papers, if you read the notes of the Constitutional Convention, this was a serious debate about how to create a political form that would allow for truly representational democracy but that would also be in a form that would protect the individual, the minority, that would not be a tyranny of the majority, that was a true republic. 
for, in which the essence of the republic is the protection of future generations, not your generation. Now, one interesting uh, demonstration of this, which I gave the people the other day, but I'll, I'm going to repeat, and uh, to, to get people a sense of what they don't know about history. What are you taught about history? To the extent you're taught history, probably, I, I would guess a lot of people here weren't taught much of this. In the case of Lincoln, you might have heard. You know, Link, Think about what you hear about these guys, right? Lincoln was really, some people say he was a slave owner. Now, that, that's a real, they're actually, there's an, a remarkable number of people who think that Lincoln was a slave owner. This is one guy, this one uh, guy, African-American, yeah, Ron Bennett, who went, Ron Bennett who went you know, off the deep end. It's simply factually not true. There's no proof for it. Now, he had, fr he had a friend who was a slave owner, Speed, but he did not, Lincoln never came near owning a slave. His wife's family owned slaves, but he never owned a slave. Yet there are, there's a significant minority of Americans who believe this, particularly younger Americans, because it fits. He really wasn't interested in emancipating the slaves. It was he was a practical, power-hungry politician, very ambitious, who always, despite the fact that he was a, you know, a one schoolroom uh, student and then became a lawyer and a, you know, a small town, blah, blah, blah. He had great ambitions, maybe, and then you get the, the ones I like, is then you get the Freudian analysis. And, you know, he, he was mother dominated because he had, was a very strong mother and a very weak father, and the strong mother died young, but then he had a strong stepmother. <laughs> and uh, they filled him up with illusions of grandeur, or delusions of grandeur, and he wanted to be the president. And he became the president at the time of the Civil War. And uh, then he had to do all these strange things, which he didn't really want to do. Now you may say, well, maybe that's Lincoln. You know, you know, you could say, well, you know, why, why lionize the guy? He was, it was 150 years ago. True, he got shot for what he believed. True, the Civil War started over the election of Lincoln. He was considered a casus belli to the South. But... He was just a practical politician. Now, if you want one part of the country that does have some of this blood and soil mentality, it's the South. It's the Confederacy. Hopefully, even that will dry up, but it's, there is an element of that in the lost cause. That's what I mean by the difference. Now, but ask, then ask yourself about Ben Franklin. Yeah, you can do it. Ben Franklin, kind of a chubby womanizer <laughs> who gallivanted around Europe. You know, uh, wasn't you know, it was kind of a a witty almanac writer who had all these little aphorisms: a penny saved is a penny earned. <laughs> Accidentally discovered electricity because he ran around with a kite <laughs> in bad weather, and uh, and discovered electricity. Or certain elements of electricity, but basically, otherwise, a very de practical, not anti, really not terribly intellectual, et cetera, et cetera. So that's Ben Franklin. Okay, I mean, you you could go through this. Of course, then you know George Washington was a slave owner, uh, kind of part of the wealthy businessmen who tried to found, found the country. Um, Hamilton was really a monarchist in disguise. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, believed in the tyranny of central government. And Franklin Roosevelt, now here's a guy that they really, Roosevelt was kind of a, uh, a swell, as they used to call him, in, in the uh, 20s and 30s. I don't know the exact definition of this, but there was a word called the swell. These were guys who were just sort of upper crusty, maybe upper middle class to patrician status. And they were sort of happy-go-lucky, but they had a certain amount of, cool to them. You know, they weren't like overly uh, egregious. They, they, they knew how to act. They dressed well and so on and so forth. Uh, I guess you would just say, you know, a swell. There's probably no parallel for it. And then he sort of, he brought this funny kind of strange sense of entitlement and optimism to the presidency. And he's just this kind of a happy guy 
optimistic, kind of substanceless, but just kind of like that. And he brought optimism to a depressed country. We were in the Depression. And he uplifted the spirit of the population by his waving at people through the uh, train window, <laughs> the, the, the plastic cigarette holder, which was always slightly upturned. And he go, yes, we're going to find our way out of the Depression where, you know, don't worry, et cetera, et cetera. And that was, you know, not, a, not, a, not a, 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 an intelligent bone in his body, except he was a good, he was a very conniving, deceitful, manipulative political figure. And he knew how to use the early media because he the fireside chat, radio, you know, clever guy. <laughs> sort of, you know, the, the, mo the early version of spin. <laughs> Manipulated people and so on and so forth. You know, not nearly as good as Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> now, who, who are the heroes of the neocons? George Bush's hero is Winston Churchill. Gingrich's hero was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was an imperialist. In the, in the deepest bones of his body, he was an imperialist. He fought World War II. You know, he, it said he really wanted to fight World War II. The Americans were reluctant. He knew he wanted to fight Hitler. He wanted to maintain the empire. He had a dispute with Edward VIII and so on and so forth. Why? They were supporting Hitler. And a whole f faction of the British Empire thought if you supported the Nazis, the Nazis would fight the Russians, the Soviets. And they would clobber each other, and at the right moment, the British and maybe the French allies could jump on the back and take the, reap the benefits of this war. And they were wrong. It didn't work that way. It couldn't work that way. And so they created a Frankenstein, but they supported it, just like a number of people out of Wall Street supported it, including George W. Bush's grandfather including Brown Brothers Harriman, including Schroeder's Bank. And they found that they had created something of a monstrosity, not just what happened later on, but the fact is that there's no way that they could have simply gone east. And so Churchill had some idea, but it was Roosevelt who organized by the support of the Americans the British into the war against Hitler. Had it not been for Roosevelt's support, it's not at all clear which faction would have won in Great Britain. Because the British, and what was Churchill committed to? Churchill was com committed to maintaining the empire. And part of the reason he wanted to make sure they were allied with the United States was because the idea was control the United States and thereby guarantee that we get what we want at the end of the war, which was what? The maintenance of India, which, which Churchill was committed to through the entire war. The maintenance of the empire, what later became the Commonwealth. This was an open dispute between Churchill and Roosevelt through the entire war. There's, no, there's absolutely no doubt about it. This is documented in papers, not just Elliot Roosevelt. James, John McGregor Burns, a couple of these Canadian guys, they, it's all there. Roosevelt said over and over again, we will not fight the war to reinstitute colonialism. And that was what came out of the war. That's, in many ways, the importance of Roosevelt having died before the end of the war. Because had he lived, that impulse, which was also the impulse that led to the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, the, the, uh, the decolonialization, this was all out of the war and Roosevelt's leadership. What, what did Churchill want? Churchill wanted to maintain the colonies. 
What did Truman do? Truman brought the Japanese back in to Indonesia. The 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 the, uh, the Dutch back in Indonesia. The Japanese came in first. The Japanese were sent back into Indochina, and then the French came in. So this is what we're dealing with. Much of what you see with respect to this uh, this uh, constant and, and one of the, and the great line is they were all pragmatic politicians. They had no ideas. They had no purpose. They had no mission. They were just trying to win election after election after election. Now, of course, there's something to winning an election if you want to continue to carry out your policy. But that's not what these guys did. You want one of the great cases that's known but has been increasingly buried was the battle over opening up the second front during World War II. Now, the second front was the Western Front. And actually, you sort of have to see a map to see how significant this was, because Europe is, 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 is arrayed much more east to west than you think. I think most of us think of it being a little more north and south and east and west. But if you look at it, it's France, slightly north, France, Germany, Poland, Russia, roughly speaking. Okay, So the whole idea was you, ha you had to land... You had to you had to land from the west onto the European continent. By by the early 1940s, the entire European continent was dominated by fascism. Italy, of course, the German conquest of most of continental Europe, other fascist allies, the Romanians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, who was fighting the Germans at this point? The Nazis. The Soviet Union. And this is somewhat overwhelming stuff because it, it's, it's somewhat mind-boggling. Because the, the, the so-called Eastern Front between the Soviets and the Nazis was the single biggest military front in human history by far. In other words, you had uh, German and, and Soviet troops lined up a, 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 on an 800-mile front almost continuously with a couple of million troops on each side. Now, you, you kind of have to think. It was a different time technologically, but, you know, you, you think we've got 160,000 troops in, in Iraq. They had about a million and a half troops on the Soviet side or more, tens of thousands of tanks, artillery, aircraft, and everything that went with it. Now, what did the Soviets want? They were facing the great bulk of the Wehrmacht. Uh, I forget the numbers, but like 180 divisions. And I'm not; th those are not exaggerated numbers. If anything, I'm being a little conservative. Now, not all the divisions were full, but probably on average eight to 10,000 troops per division. So a lot, of, a lot of troops, or five to eight, something like that, okay? So what did the Soviets want? The Soviets kept saying, open up a Western Front. Open up the Western Front, draw some of the forces off, weaken it. What did the American military want? They wanted a second front. Eisenhower, Marshall, King, the, the entire Joint Chiefs. They wanted a second front as early as late 1942. Now remember, the U.S. was only in the war as of late 1941. Now, that may have been a little premature in the sense of whether the United States was ready to do it then. But certainly by early 43, the consensus among the American military figures was we want a front. This is essential to the war and so on and so forth. And don't forget, we were supplying the Soviets, and, and so forth. What did Churchill say? What did the British say? No. Put it off. Put it off. Now, the line was they were just putting it off. We weren't ready, we weren't ready, we weren't ready. I'll, show, I'll make the point it was a lie. What did Churchill want? Northern Africa. 
the Mediterranean, Greece. Why? Because they viewed the Mediterranean as the key, the key to controlling the empire. The Mediterranean, the Gulf, the Indian Ocean. To a certain extent, they were also they also had an eye on China. The British Empire was the objective. Now, what puts a, a, a lest anyone think that this is an exaggeration, what puts a fine point on it is when the Second Front was opened on June 6, 1944. This was to be followed up by a landing in southern France around Marseille, which was supposed to link up with the uh, landing in north, northwest France. Now, the main force was what's known as D-Day, the channel crossing, you know, uh, northern France, the beaches at Omaha, and so on and so, and so forth, Normandy. But the idea was, within a very short period of time, there was supposed to be another force coming up from the south. This is June 6, 1944, 8th, 10th. The British delayed it. In fact, they were not going to do it. At another point, they ran this lunatic operation called Operation Market Garden, where Montgomery landed somewhere up in Holland and said, wait. And, of course, this thing was a disaster. They never got down anywhere near the Western Front. So the, the British were doing everything they could do to sabotage the Western Front for two reasons. One, they still harbored the idea that you would get an attrition rate between the Nazi, the Germans, the Wehrmacht, and the Soviet Union. And this would be to the advantage of the British. And secondly, they wanted to keep their forces in the Eastern Mediterranean and work up into the soft underbelly, which was the, the great geopolitical game of the 19th century, underneath of the Soviet Union and into protecting the, the, uh, the, uh, the colonies. That's what was going. Ro that's what Roosevelt fought. So this is the truth of the story about the, the pragmatic Mr. Roosevelt. But there's even more to it. Because look, Roosevelt did not come in. He, think of what Roosevelt came into. It wasn't the same thing as we have now, but there were interesting comparisons. The United States, as the, one of the two leading industrial powers in the world at that time, was going through the biggest, the greatest depression in our history. Not necessarily the greatest financial panic to begin with, because we had huge panics in the 19th century, but the biggest economic depression. By, 19, by the time Roosevelt came in, in the period between 29 and 33 with some ups and downs, because the Depression really hits not in 29. And while it hasn't played out in the same way it's played out now, these things, this is how they work. The, the, the stock market collapsed in October of 29. And this led to a great wipeout of financial values. But the, the Depression didn't really hit till 31, 32, with the collapse of the, some of the leading international banking systems in Germany and then in the United States. The collapse of the Herstadt Bank and other, uh, you know, uh, waves of bankruptcies in the United States and so forth. Now, what had happened was something not unlike what we see today. A huge speculative bubble was built up, unregulated financial activity utility holding companies, massive amounts of debt, and then the way in which the insanity of the war reparations were handled after World War I, where the entire blame was laid on the Germans. Remember, these weren't the Nazis. This was a war that most of the European countries uh, didn't have really any excuse for. The British didn't, the French didn't, the Russians didn't, and the Germans didn't. This was a war that was manipulated largely by the British, to destroy any possibility of certain kinds of political developments on the continent. 
but the Germans ended up being blamed, and there were reparations, which were paid from the Germans to the French and the British, which were used to prop up the financial values of Europe. When this thing blew out, they came the United States through the Dawes and the Young Plan lent the money to the Germans who paid the money to the British and the French who paid the money back to the United States. Now this cycle of uh, uh, international loans, which was then spinning off money that went into, into speculation, ultimately blew up the financial system. Now when this happened, in this case, there was a major deflation because there was a massive uh, collapse in the circulation of the financial system and the confidence in the financial system. And so by 31-32, the United States faced 25% unemployment. In some cities in the United States, unemployment was at 70%. In the farm sector, unemployment was 37%. Now, what happened? Is it really the case that Roosevelt came in as this bungling pragmatist and just kind of tried to make do and borrowed from Mussolini and all this kind of stuff? Not true. And there's an interesting little point on this. What, what happened? Roosevelt, now there's an interesting element to Roosevelt's own personal development which is one of these things that is worth looking at, although I, I, I don't, th I, we can only ma make certain points about it. Roosevelt came from a patrician family. Um, and it, it's kind of hard to say exactly where he stood as a younger man. There's a lot of talk that he was, you know, an airhead and this and that. I don't know enough to deny that, okay? but. <laughs> Would I it'd be worth looking into? But what I do know is that when he suffered poliomyelitis at the age of 39 and became a paraplegic in 19, I think it was about 1922 or something like that. Maybe, yeah, yeah, about 1921, 22, something like that. He clearly went through a major personal transformation. And this is not something, he, every, his whole political outlook changed. And he became sort of the, he wasn't just a guy who went to this Warm Springs place. Um, he basically attempted to lead out of Warm Springs a program of developing a solution for polio and other paralytic diseases. His whole idea of social responsibility was clearly strengthened. His idea of the general welfare, the necessity to take care of people who are less well endowed, well, less fortunate, developed. And as the governor of New York in that, from 28 to 32, he instituted an old age benefits plan, an unemployment plan, effectively social security. He moved to regulate utilities, spread electrical power, and so on and so forth. All the things that were hallmarks of the very beginning of his administration, he was already acting on as the governor of New York. So this wasn't some pragmatic adaptation to the problem. And indeed, he did, he did things that were shocking when he came in, though they were in some ways, you know, in the wind. Now, what, did, what, what kind of thing am I talking about? Think about the following. I read this to some people, but it's worth redoing. Because, you, you know, uh, as you heard, Lynn LaRouche refers to the preamble of the Constitution as embodying the underlying pr principles of the Republic. Now, in, uh, in the, his collecting of his papers, Roosevelt writes an introduction to volume two, where he defines the New Deal. Now remember the New Deal, for those of you who don't know, became the slogan of his first campaign. I'm gonna get, we're gonna have a New Deal for the American people as compared to the Depression and so on and so forth. 
Um, He's talking about the convention. He says, from that discussion and our desire to epitomize the immediate needs of the nation came the phrase, a new deal, which was used first in that acceptance speech and which has very aptly become the popular expression to describe the major objectives of the administration. The word deal implied that the government itself was going to use affirmative action to bring about its avowed objectives rather than stand by and hope that general economic laws alone would attain them. Now think about this, because isn't that just the line of the present administration? The economic laws reign supreme. You can't intervene. You let the economic laws take care of people and whatever the outcome is they, they, they say. Now, Roosevelt says exactly the opposite. By a, to use affirmative action to bring about its avowed objective rather than stand by and hope that general economic laws alone would attain them. The words new implied that a new order of things designed to benefit the great mass of our farmers, workers, and businessmen would replace the old order of special privilege in a nation which was completely and thoroughly disgusted with the existing dispensation. Now remember, this is the same Roosevelt, I'm not gonna, who in his inaugural address says it's time to kick the money changers out of the temple. It's time to end the speculation. This is a point that's uh, extremely significant, okay? But we were not to be content with merely hoping for these ideals. We were to use the inst oh, oh, I see. Uh, the New Deal was fundamentally intended. The New Deal was fundamentally intended as a modern expression of ideals set forth 150 years ago in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. Quote: A more perfect union, justice, domestic tranquility, the common defense, the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Unquote. So basically, Roosevelt defines the New Deal as the preamble of the Constitution, as the defining concept of the Republic. I must say, in some ways, that's one of the densest things you could think of. A more perfect union, not a perfect union. Our mission is a more perfect union, which means it's never perfect. It can always be more perfect. The, the, the mission of the Republic is the constant development of the people of the nation. Justice, domestic tranquility, the common defense, the general welfare. Now this is exactly the general welfare clause that so many of the neocons hate. Because it says that the purpose of the Republic goes beyond simply the protection of uh, somebody from the encroachment of somebody else. The, the essential Lockean definition of freedom. You're free to do whatever you want as long as you don't encroach on somebody else. And the only role of the state is to protect you from those encroachments. The libertarian outlook or the, the neocon minimal government outlook. But the general welfare clause and the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. In other words, we are obligated to leave an improved nation for each succeeding generation, for every generation that we leave behind, that, is, that succeeds us, our mission is to leave a better place for them. And a better place for them, of course, means a better place from which they can leave a better place for those that succeed them. It's the same admonition for every generation. That's the New Deal. And then he goes on, but we were not to be content with merely hoping for these ideals. We were to use the instrumentalities and powers of government actively to fight for them. There would be no effort to circumscribe the scope of private initiative so long as the rules of fair play were observed. There would be no obstacle to the incentive of reasonable and legitimate private profit. Because the American system from its inception presupposed and sought to maintain a society based on personal liberty, on private ownership of property, and on reasonable private property from each man's labor or capital, the New Deal would insist on all three factors. Now, by the way, th this completely adumbrates things in Lincoln, who often says, labor comes before capital. And by that, he simply means not that we're anti-capital, but that it's the development of the labor power of the population 
the intellectual powers, the skills and so forth, that comes first, out of which capital comes. So this is a complete resonance of that. There's a funny thing that Roosevelt does later on when he takes over the banks, uh, and they're you know they're basically bankrupt. He says, uh, when we reopen them, they're going to be opened up under and, and, that, and that anyone involved in the sale of securities has to make public what those securities are about. Now, of course, if you know hedge funds today, for example. The whole point of a hedge fund is they don't have to tell you anything. They have you know, less than 100 investors. They're all well off. And the idea is you can be completely secret. Now, when, this came, when Roosevelt came out with this, the big line was, in any good capitalist system, caveat emptor. Buyer beware. It's up to you to know if you're being screwed. That, that, that in a free market, in effect, in a free market, somebody who wants to sell something can do anything he wants to sell it. It's up to you to be smart enough not to be conned. Now, you think about free market theory. Now, what, what Roosevelt said is, we're going to introduce a new principle, caveat vendor. Seller beware, at least as much as the buyer. That if you do something, if you do something, and we catch you doing something deceitful, mm -hmm. then we have a right to catch you in what you're, you're doing. So you, what you have is an entirely different sense of the principles. But these are the principles that have always come to bear when the country's going through a crisis. It's effectively what Lincoln did. Look, the whole argument that the South had was free trade. The argument for slavery, ironically enough, think about it, was free trade. We have a right to run the cotton business as long as we have a market abroad any way we see fit. And since the slave is property, we have the right to handle the slave any way we want. And it's essentially a free market principle. And Lincoln said, no, it's not. And people could say he wasn't this and that. But he says from the time he's in his mid-20s, these are human beings. And one of the problems people come up with is you have to realize what, what Lincoln was not coming out of a, a culture where everybody believed in the equality, the equal capabilities. What he said is, the Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal. Now, I'm not going to really get into whether they have equal talent, equal intelligence, or anything. But they are treated equally as human beings. And the one thing that there is no doubt of is that the slave is a human being. Therefore, slavery is wrong. And who were, of course, the big leaders of the, uh, uh, the, the anti-slavery movement of the late 18th century were Franklin and Hamilton. And that's the truth of the matter. And there's even more to be said for Washington. So this is the reality. Mostly everything you've been taught about these people has been from a British standpoint, from an anti-independent standpoint to this day. Now, I, I want to also give you a sense of something that often comes up if I can find it. Now, I have to, the problem is I didn't have time to look some of this stuff up. Because people are always saying, well, how can we do this with the banks? How can we do that with the banks? Well, I'll give you one, one other thing. This is where he goes through the laundry list of the New Deal. They were the New Deal in action. Okay, all these examples of the authority of the government, the hundred days, etc. I'm not. Gonna, these are the. New, they were the New Deal in action. Government acting to bring about not only immediate recovery, but its long-range objectives and reform. For underlying all the immediately effective provisions of these laws and all the activities of the agencies under them, 
was the ever-directing purpose of permanence of objectives. We knew that a leaderless system of economy had produced and would again produce economic and social disaster. Private leadership had been non-existent from the point of view of seeking the objectives of national welfare. Government leadership was the only method left. Briefly, the objectives here have always been and still are. A chance for men and women to work in industry at decent wages and reasonable hours or to engage in farming at a decent return. A chance to keep savings and banks safe from speculative use of other people's money and to make investments without da danger of deception or fraud by greedy promoters and speculators. A chance for adequate recreation, better housing, sounder health. A chance to make reasonable profit in business protected against monopolies and unfair competition but organized so as to provide fair prices for the consuming public. Planning and use of natural resources for the benefit of average men and women, social security against the hardships of old age, security against unexpected or seasonal unemployment, security against new as well as old types, types of criminals, secu security against war. The, the task of reconstruction we undertook in, in 1933 did not call for creation of strange values. It was rather finding a way, to gain to, uh, way again to old values but somewhat forgotten ideals and values. Through methods and means and details may have been, uh, in some instances, new. The objectives were as permanent as human nature itself. And this is what he says in 19, in his introduction in 1937. It's the policies from 1933. So this is really what we're dealing with. And the, the, the other point to realize in this is when Lynn says that Roosevelt saved the United States from dictatorship. That we could have gone the same way as Germany under Hitler. That, by the way, is a serious proposition. When, Hit, when Roosevelt came, was elected, and during the election and after he was elected, there were calls for dictatorship in the United States, not from the rabble in the streets, from Walter Lippmann the leading liberal journalist of the day, from William Randolph Hearst, from many intellectual leaders who thought that the, that the world was so out of whack that we needed dictatorship. And they called on Roosevelt to take dictatorial power. And what I mean by that is, for example, somebody wrote for one of his speeches, his, one, his first or second speech, that he would call upon the veterans of World War I and the American Legion, of course, who later tried to kill him, but to, over, to join, follow his commands if necessary in, in, in enforcing order and security in the nation. He never gave that speech. Because indeed, Roosevelt didn't believe in it. Roosevelt made the point that I'm going to be, a, I'm going to act to save the country based on constitutional means, we don't need a dictatorship in the United States. We have the, the means in the Constitution. Had, had someone other than Roosevelt been elected, we may have gone down a different path. He really was what stood between us and dictatorship. That's not just some uh, dramatic uh, you know, thing to say, or, or what seems to be just a formal historical abstraction. Well, yes, Germany went Nazi. We went, the other, we went a different way. Some cynics would say, well, you know, we really didn't go a different way. We just won the war. But you know, uh, I don't think that's really what happened. Roosevelt rejected dictatorship when he could have had it. If he had said, you have to give me total power, direct rule over the military, et cetera, et cetera. He might have gotten it at that point. It's very hard for people today to imagine how desperate people were in 1932 and 33. In, in many ways, much more devastating than 9-11. Today, people are frightened. They're easily manipulated. But in 32, 33, people didn't have jobs. People were living in Hoovervilles or, th or feared ending up living in a Hooverville. Farms were shut. People dropped out of school in droves. 
They couldn't go to college. They had to go at the age of 15 and find work. And they, people were scared in a different sense, in the sense that they really didn't have a future and couldn't secure one. They couldn't say, if I simply get a hold of all the terrorists, we, we can go ahead. The, view, the, view, the situation was more devastating in one sense. They, they had no confidence that the country worked at all. And so, you know, had Roosevelt come in and said, give me all the power I need to restore security, stability, there would have been certainly a significant group in the country that might have said yes. And there were people calling for it. Roosevelt said no. So when Lynn calls upon this tradition, a any idea that Lynn's calling on this tradition because Lynn has dictatorial ambitions is insane. This is precisely the tradition that is against dictatorship. The only people who freak out about this, if you want to know the truth, are the financial factions that find any intrusion by the government, anything that overrides their oligarchical dictatorship, they view as authoritarian. Now, I'll give you another sense of this, and it's only is somewhat humorous, given the way people react. And this is actually um, a press conference. And there's a certain amount of back and forth about on the record and off the record. But let me give you a sense. I, I wish I could find I, mean, I, I should have. Um, let me see. Why well, not? This is a better place. Let me give you a recommendation of the Congress for legislation to control resumption of banking. On March 3rd, banking operations in the United States ceased. Period. Now, do people understand what the bank holiday was? Banking stopped. There was a, basically about a one-week vacation for most banks. Well, uh, to review at this time, the causes of this failure of our banking system is unnecessary. Suffice it to say, the government has been compelled to step in for the protection of depositors and the business of the nation. Now, this isn't foreclosures, but think about what that is. The government has been compelled to step in for the protection of depositors and the business of the nation. Our first task is to reopen all sound banks. This is an essential preliminary to subsequent legislation directed against speculation with the funds of depositors and other violations of positions of trust. In order that the first objective, the opening of the banks for the resumption of business, may be accomplished, I ask of the Congress the immediate enactment of legislation giving the executive branch of the government control over the banks for the protection of depositors. Authority forthwith to open such banks as have already been ascertained to be in sound condition, and other such banks as rapidly as possible, and authority to reorganize and reopen such banks as may be found to require reorganization to put them on a sound basis. Now, I think those of you who followed some of what Lynn has said, reorganize the banks, shut down, the, keep the sound ones off, keep the, get the sound ones back on, take the time you need to do it. I ask amendments to the Federal Reserve Act to pri provide for additional currency, adequately secured as it may become necessary to issue to meet all demands for currency and at the same time to achieve this end without increasing the unsecured indebtedness of the government of the United States. Now, one of the things that goes here is he's saying, we're only going to do what is needed to restart the economy and restart the banking system. We're not going to cover all of the speculative elements of the bank because that would require the U.S. to go into unsecured debt, not secured against 
actual productive activity. Now, also note, a lot of this isn't a lot of detail. What is he doing? A lot of them criticize him for being like this. He's, uh, he's laying out the principles on which the reorganization is going to take place. And some of the, the general schematic approaches based on those principles. He's not saying here, this agency, that agency, this guy. That's to be worked out. It's not as important as people make it out to be. I cannot too strongly urge upon Congress the clear necessity for immediate action. A continuation of the strangulation of banking facilities is unthinkable. The passage of proposed legislation will end this condition, and I trust within a short space of time will result in the resumption of business activity. In addition, it is my belief that this legislation will not only lift immediately all unwarranted doubts and suspicion in regard to banks, which are 100% sound, but will also mark the beginning of a new relationship between the banks and the people of this country. The members of the new Congress will realize I am confident the grave responsibility which lies upon me and them. In the short space of five days, it is impossible for us to formulate completed measures to prevent the recurrence of the evils of the past. This does not and should not, however, justify any delay in accomplishing this first step. At an early moment, I shall request of the Congress two other measures, which I regard as of immediate urgency. With action taken thereupon, we can proceed to consideration of a rounded program of national restoration. And then he talks about in the footnotes the Emergency Banking Act that was confirmed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But this is it. The whole proclamation to Congress is this long. <laughs> it's a leaflet. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things is if you look through what Roosevelt says throughout this entire period, one of his great points of attack is speculation. Unhindered, unregulated speculation, speculation that's wrecked the financial system and the economy. A lot of his critics never bring this up. They say, well, he really didn't understand monetarism. I have one, one book, this one book by this great this lunatic author, who's the uh, former editor of Newsweek, I think. Or one of the wrote for Newsweek. Let's see. No. Yeah, Newsweek. Senior editor at Newsweek. So there's two elements to him I think is funny. One is he's a new journalist, so he views everything as spin. And all he talks about is how Roosevelt did had this political spin. He doesn't use the word spin, but how he manipulated the press and how it was all he was a great actor and so on and so forth. The other thing is he basically says Roosevelt didn't understand economics, that if he had understood monetarism, and he, then he says others around him didn't either, he would have realized that by simple uh, flooding, really, of, of credit into the system, everything would have been all right. That basically there was just a certain amount of panic and so on and so forth. That it was all psychological. Now, the truth of the matter is, Roosevelt is extremely clear, and Alter never mentions this. He doesn't, to my, as far as I can see, even mention once the word speculation. Whereas Roosevelt is clear. The problem we have in, this, in the financial system is that the speculative sides of financial investment have completely overtaken the uh, more trustworthy elements of, the fina of financing uh, industrial and agricultural expansion. Now, there are, other, there are funny elements in Roosevelt that I think require a little bit more thinking. I'm not saying because he talks about overproduction, particularly overproduction in agriculture. On the one hand, I think that's clearly not the problem. He's, he, he, he's, it, but, but I think partly what he's reacting to is you have a contraction in demand because there's basically a deflationary element in the world economy. And it, it, there's not an increase in, in, in living standards on a global scale. There's no new uh, decolonized market. And so, in effect, you end up with an overproduction. And he's trying to bring some of the price. What he really talks about is creating a situation where farm prices go up. 
And some of it is not cutting back production. He actually talks about ways to force farm prices up. So there's a, there's, there are some more difficult elements in what he has to say in his view of the economic policy. But, for example, when he talks about free trade, he means fair trade. And you can see it in what he's talking about. He does not say no tariffs, et cetera. He doesn't even say no protection. What he says is we have to find ways to create conditions of free and fair trade. So it's legitimate up to a certain point to protect an area of industry or agriculture. And, of course, you're dealing with one other situation, which is the industry of the period was not as devastated as the industry is today. You were not dealing with an economy like the economy today, which is less than 10 percent manufacturing. The economy of the day was about 50 percent industry and agriculture. So he's faced with, with a slightly different set of problems. But I think in principle, no. He's very aware of the runaway financial mechanisms, the conception of the oligarchy, the financial oligarchy, and the essential constitutional principles under which to bring the, 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 the country out of the Depression. Now, he didn't fully succeed, but he did succeed in creating conditions for massive cap uh, industrial capability and production. He did fundamentally succeed in bringing the country out of the depths of the Depression. And he created a country strong enough to win World War II, which is not a small thing. Now, the other thing to learn is most of these things are available to us today to deal with the financial crisis, to deal with the collapse, in this case, of the mortgages, to straighten out the entirely bankrupt financial system, which is what we see falling apart today on an international scale. But we can begin with a series of measures that straighten out the bankruptcy of the Federal Reserve System. And it's within the powers of the Constitution and the law. And it's been done before. Now, one of the things I think we should consider is, you know, there's a draft uh, of a model resolution that Lynn has on the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act, which should be seen as a lever to the same kind of reorganization of the financial system. And then the standpoint from which the United States would be in a position to call for a new Bretton Woods. That this can be done in the weeks ahead, initiated, won in the Congress. And I think next Thursday night at the Legacy Club meeting, this will be the theme of the meeting. We may even have some guest speakers that we're working on from the Center for Responsible Lending. We'll approach city councils and so on and so forth. But what we have now is a mission to implement this now in exactly the same way as Lincoln saw himself as saving the Union and as Roosevelt saw himself as pledged to get the country out of the Depression. Okay, any questions? It's funny, his declaration that, that actually shut the banks down is about the same length, it's about a page. He just says, you can't export gold, you can't do uh, exchange foreign currencies, and so on and so forth. He just lists a few things. He says, that's it. Until you straighten that out, you can't keep your doors open. Now, some of this was already going on. Various states were calling bank holidays already. Michigan, Maryland, a number of other states, because the banking system was shot. So what Roosevelt said is, okay, we got to shut the whole thing down and clean it out and protect people. You're going to get your money back. Your actual savings and checking accounts are going to be protected. What was, what was he doing? Buying up the gold? Well, he just did. The, the, the idea wasn't that you, you, there was a way. What part of these guys were doing was they were shipping gold out of the country or hoarding gold. And there was a kind of uh, problematic gold standard at the time. It was Roosevelt who went over to what they called the gold reserve standard. That's why you get all this stuff that he stole the gold and <coughs> he 
he created fiat money. This is all these lunatics. But he, he, he had to put a clamp, given the existing situation, it's like, it's like exchange controls. And that's effectively what he did. He basically said you can't take money out of the country for speculative purposes. <coughs> In fact, I, I'd have to find the quote, but he's, that's exactly what he said. You can take money out of the country if you're engaged in real uh, a, a positive economic activity. But you can't take money out of the country just to speculate. So you have to sign off on what you're doing with the money that you take out of the country. And the same thing went for the gold. I think that was more, it, it was a little different. I mean, uh, first of all, Lincoln was coming into a country that was splitting in half. So you have to take that into account. Okay, this, this was chaos. Remember, there were economic relations between the North and the South. There was banking from the South into the North and so on and so forth. Now, secondly, there was no national currency. The dollar didn't exist. Different banks, different states printed their own currency, even though that was a violation of the Constitution. It was Lincoln who created a national currency called the Greenback. So in a sense, Lincoln was instituting it in a different way, the same principles that Roosevelt, except he was initiating the idea of the federal control over the national currency. In fact, when Lincoln came in, the story was he had to go to the Northern Bank to chase, to borrow money to run the war. And they didn't lend him all the money he needed. That's part of how he ended up saying, okay, we're gonna just issue our own currency. But we, and we do have the right to do that. So that's the kind of situation he came into. The United States had been largely wrecked by the British. We were run by British connected banking interests. And similar things were true in the United States in the, in the, in the, um, in the uh, early part of the 20th century. J.P. Morgan was a British originated bank financial interest. And he was the leading financier of the period. But that was the situation with the Civil War. You had two things going. The country was splitting apart, which of course led to throw through chaos anyway. And I, I don't know everything that uh, every you know decree that Lincoln came up with, but Lincoln went to Wall Street for the money for the war, and he couldn't get it, and not not everything he needed. And so he said, "We're going to basically do what the Constitution allows us to do. We're going to print a federal currency." They began to issue bonds and so on and so forth. They were financed the Transcontinental Railroad. That was a little. Some of it was federally financed, but some of it was financed by, uh, you know, people like Jay Cook and others. I mean, there were bankers that got into it. Uh, but a, a lot of the initiation of the um, rail systems were state and federal bonds. For example, the Baltimore and Ohio, which was the first <coughs> major rail line in the United States was largely funded by state bonds. I'm not sure what the ratio of state and federal was at the time. Yeah. Well, in that, in that period with the uh, slave states, was it that they were using, were they using effectively the uh, British pound or were they just getting financial support? From they were just getting financial support. I, they were not, they were on the pound system. I mean, they, they heavily depended on the export of cotton to Great Britain. And the British controlled the cotton trade internationally. And they were essentially, during, at this point, a one-crop economy. They've been, they've been a large tobacco section in the, in the economy uh, uh, in the 18th century. But by, by the early 19th century, it was a one-crop economy. And, and, you know, the, the, the cotton trade was 
global was entirely controlled by the British or and certain Wall Street elements that were tied to the British, like Belmont. On that, on that note, um, one of the slanders against, you know, one of the, the nagging aberrations on, on just like the way people look at the Civil War in that, that period of history is they, they try to downplay the, the, the role of slavery had in starting the war. They said, well, the northern economy was dependent upon the southern slave um, economy. I, I was wondering, like, how true is that? Like, what? Yeah, so here's where the, 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 the Wall Street was heavily tied into the slave trade and the, the cotton, really the cotton trade, okay, Wall Street. Um, just like Boston was tied into the opium trade in China, heavily. Not that there weren't Wall Street elements that weren't, that were also, but it was Boston was heavily tied into this. Now, both Boston and New York were heavily involved in the cotton trade. They fi financed it, uh, traded in it, and so on and so forth. But that was not the northern economy. The northern economy, in fact, as Lincoln points out and, and others, as Kerry points out, were heavily undermined by the cotton trade because it was and, and the slave trade. It was cheap labor. It, it, it tended to thrust a lot of the financial resources into the one crop economy and the slave trade and out of the northern industrial development. That's why the, the north really only develops heavily under the impulse of the Civil War. Now it carried over beyond the Civil War. But a lot of the potentialities for industrial development were held back by the Southern economy. You get the same thing with Andrew Jackson, who shuts down the second <coughs> national bank in the mid-1930s. And this is all part of the period when the, sl the slave trade and the cotton trade is building up. So it's more more connected to the, the merchant uh, shipping interests? Yeah, the financial interests and the shipping interests, yeah. But the financial interests, that's, that's the real, the major story. Look, the, the, one of the key things in this, the country was headed toward a breakup for 30 years. From roughly the Hartford Convention in 18, whatever it was, 1818, up until the series of compromises in the early 1850s, the, and then finally the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which broke it, really broke it open. That's a 35-year period where the whole thing is building up toward a split. I mean, if you read Quincy Adams, Quincy Adams says in like, I forget now, 18, late 1830s, <coughs> we're headed for a breakup of the country. We can't survive this way. So this is, <clears throat> at least to some people like Quincy Adams, and Lincoln certainly comes to this by the early 1850s. I mean, once the Kansas-Nebraska Act hits, he thinks that we're headed for a breakup. So that's 1854. Quincy Adams is saying things like this in the late 1830s and the early 1840s. And part of what they saw was that the country was being strangled by the cotton trade. It was undermining the industrial development, the development of the labor force. There was a pool of cheap labor. And all the investment or a large portion of the investment and financial activity was going into the slave trade. Look at one, one of the things to look at, even <clears throat> after the Civil War, as a residue of the fact that you had the underdevelopment of the South, a, a weakened labor force, a cheap labor force that still existed, because the, the, the emancipated slaves became a cheap labor force as things developed. Why? Because the South remained underdeveloped. And then look at the infrastructure of the South. The, the southern infrastructure, in some ways, hasn't developed to this day, except for the TVA. For example, take the rail system in the south, underdeveloped. If you look at the U.S. rail grid, let's say in the 1920s or 30s, compare the density of it in the north, the northeast, the Great Lakes. I mean, obviously, it thins out as it spreads west. But then compare that to the southeast. It remained a largely agricultural, cheap labor, rural system. Now that, partly that's because the intended reconstruction economic policy after, World, after the Civil War didn't, wasn't fully realized. The educational system, if you look at the situation between 65 and 77, 
you actually have black state legislators, black congressmen, the only black senator before Edmund Brooke in the, in the 1960s. You have some incipient educational programs, some scientific development. By 1876, 77, it's all shut down. And you have a reversion of cheap labor. A lot of it is prison labor. Hmm. And there's kind of a reversion to the cotton economy in, in a slightly different form. And so the South never develops. And it remains somewhat of a weight around the country. So that's how I would look at it. Quite the opposite of the way it's normally put. about the Brighton Woods system. Um, from the time that it was established in 45 uh, to up to 1971, I'm assuming that during that whole time there was a lot of developments that were made in different nations, countries that benefited from a fixed exchange rate system. But why is it that they there wasn't really a, a, a fight to have Nixon not shut down the, the Brighton Woods? That many nations well, because it was already, look, it wasn't that clean cut of development. Okay, it wasn't that black and white. Okay, the Bretton Woods the, that, that, that Roosevelt envisioned never completely got off the ground. What you really had was a certain momentum of what <clears throat> he initiated that, a lot, that kept a certain uh, momentum of decolonization and some talk about uh, economic development. But these countries were not strong countries. And the development was never fully realized. I mean, there were already moves against the decolonization in 1947, 48. You had the, uh, you, you have ultimately the Vietnam War. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of complicated, there's a lot of political things that go on. There was also in the United States the increasing hegemony of this, uh, uh, you know, monetarist economic outlook. And I, the, the, the other countries opposed what happened, but they didn't have the strength to stop it. Now, in part, they didn't have the strength to stop it because the financial system was blowing out. The pound went down, the dollar went down, and so there, was, there were moves coming from Wall Street and London to break from the any kind of fixed exchange rate system and to move to a fully speculative system. And they control the levers of financial power. Most of these third world countries did not have that much to say about it. They were relatively weak economically, they weren't great powers, and they had not developed that much. Because indeed, as you got further into the 50s and the 60s, more and more roadblocks were being put into their development. And so it's a longer story. There were, there were some good things that happened. There was some independence, but most of the economic development had already begun to break down by the mid-1960s. Mid there was not any great industrial development or infrastructure development in Africa, large chunks of Asia. There were plans to do this. Roosevelt envisioned, for example, a whole rail grid for northern Africa. It never happened. So the real use of the Bretton Woods Agreement, and one of the weaknesses of it was it was largely an agreement amongst the developed se sector. And the idea was, you know, we would move on from there to, as part of the decolonization, to the economic development of the South. But it never got there. And in fact, increasingly it got turned into what it became later on. So the IMF itself was largely just an administrative agency. It's only in about 70, 71 that it becomes the arbiter of whether or not nations got credit. So it became something totally different after 71. But you have to realize most of these countries were newly freed, you know, underdeveloped economically. They, they did not, as they say, have economic clout. And so when the major financial powers, you know, moved to into a, a more speculative system, they, they were pretty much able to move on their own. There was no counterweight financially to that.
I was reading something on the Bretton Woods recently, um, which is, it was actually written in 45, and it was trying to teach people about what the Bretton Woods, like, argument was, and, um, like, the common person or something, which is kind of cool, because it's teaching people about money and stuff like that. But, um, in there, it was talking about how, uh, Keynes, like, his argument was that he wanted the, the IMF to be, like, a, um, like a bookkeeper or something, to have, um, and then the counter idea was that there was like this fund, right, for nine trillion dollars or nine billion, billion or something, that all the countries would put in, and then they would actually have to deposit, they wanted to get some sort of like loan for something, they would have to deposit the money in, and then get something out of it, like deposit gold and their currency, but that Keynes wanted to just like give a check to the country or something like that. And I was kind of wondering, like, I didn't really get it, like, quite exactly. Like, what, it, that was the only thing I got out of, like, the difference mm. between the two, but, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know the, all, all that much on, on that debate. I mean, Keynes was a monetarist. Mm -hmm. So you have to realize sometimes that the, the basic idea of, in a sense, a subscription, this is what you call subscribing to a fund like that. And so they, they, these funds would be soundly based on the commitments of different countries. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the weakness in this was it was not that specific as to the development of the third world at this point. Some of this had to do with the development of Europe, the rebuilding of Europe, the Marshall Plan, and so on and so forth. Okay. okay. So the idea that you would establish it like the, uh, and I don't know if it was this clear on this, but the idea that you would establish it based on the, the subscribing of bonds and debt from existing countries, and every country would put something into it. Mm -hmm. But then, on that basis, you'd have a pool of funds that could be used to develop, to sell bonds, to, to back up the development of a given country. Would be a, a fairly sound basis. Keynes's approach, I suspect, was pure monetarism. Yeah. And so the idea was, what, what you headed for later on, which is the IMF became the arbiter of credit. In other words, it was up to the IMF whether or not you were credit worthy. That's the way it works to this day. Okay, but especially during the 70s and 80s, the IMF would go in and say, well, you don't have enough free market. You, you pay too much to your public employees. Therefore, you're not credit worthy. Therefore, we're not going to issue, we're, we're going to say that, and therefore the banks won't issue you any credit. Okay? So I, my, my suspicion is that that's the kind of difference we're talking about. That if you had a pool of funds that was subscribed to the various nations backing it up, this would be a sound basis quite apart from any measure of creditworthiness. That, that, that in effect, the IMF would, uh, would run that risk as part of the development proposal. But it would, would be based on the, uh, you know, the existing contribution, so to speak, made by the various countries, and probably every country would have to do something. But I don't know enough about all the details. That's just one direction to look at. Yeah, okay? there's a, the other thing was I was confused about the gold part of it, too. Like, because the gold standard and the gold sort of standard. There's, 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 there's one point on this that's of relevance, because this can get complicated, and people always put different things into it. A gold standard means that for every currency that you issue, there's some measure of gold. Yeah. So it becomes a highly restrictive monetary policy. Now, obviously, you can change things. But in other words, effectively, for every dollar, there's some amount of gold that's held by either a bank or the, or the government, which means that you there's extreme restrictions on the issuance of credit. You can't issue credit unless there's gold there for it. You can't monetize it, okay? The gold reserve standard is quite different, okay? That says all you have to do, you can have all kinds of currency and credit. All the gold has to do is account for imbalances. So if at the end of the day, I'm short and I have to borrow some money to cover my accounts, I have to have a certain amount of gold against what I'm short. But that does not affect the magnitude that you exchange. Let's say I, I might trade a trillion dollars back and forth. 
okay? But I'm sh at the end of the day, I owe some country a million dollars. I've got to come up with, I've got to be able to guarantee enough gold at some standard rate against that million dollars. So that doesn't restrict me all that much. It means that there's a certain restriction that comes in and you use gold as, as a uh, something that everybody will accept to settle accounts. But I can do a trillion dollars, I can do two trillion dollars. If my imbalance is one million, I need the same amount of gold. If I'm on the gold standard, I can only issue the amount of credit that I have in gold at whatever rate we do it. So if I've got a million dollars worth of gold, I can only issue a million dollars worth of credit. On a reserve standard, if I have a million dollars worth of gold, I might be able to issue a billion dollars, as long as I keep the imbalance within a certain range and settle that imbalance in gold. Okay? So it's a huge difference, even though people find it confusing. It means I have to watch my imbalances, mm -hmm. and I have to be able to settle them in accounts that are acceptable to everybody. But it doesn't restrict the amount of growth and credit that I have. Whereas if you're on a gold standard, whoever controls the gold controls the credit. So for a long time, the British controlled the world's gold, and they wanted a gold standard. When they didn't control the world's gold, they didn't want a gold standard. You see, you have to follow this. People get very confused, like, well, wait a minute. I read where the British are against the gold standard. So we go back 100 years, they were for the gold standard. What's the difference? 100 years ago, they controlled the gold. Things are sometimes less complicated than you think they are. Basically, you had the Missouri Compromise, and I, you know, which which said that slavery could not go above; it, it would not go into territories above a certain latitude. To make it simple, okay. Now, what happened then was Kansas and Nebraska were territories, and the compromise was broken. And they said, well, they can vote to see whether or not they want to be slaves, okay. In effect, and what Lincoln and others realized was this meant that eventually some of these territories were going to vote to be slave, and once they voted to be slave, slavery was going to spread throughout the territory or the, the new states, and that was the big issue. See, to a lot of a lot of these guys who recognized that in a sense the Confederacy came in as slave, and their view is that the slave system would die out as an economic system. Now they were a little bit that might have been a little bit optimistic, but that's what they did believe. Now, in part, what happened was that as the United States was isolated after the Revolution, you had the French victory, the, the, uh, the Napoleonic victory in Europe, you had the Congress of Vienna, the United States was more isolated <clears throat> than they ever expected to be. And the world economic and financial system was run out of London to a large extent. So the, the slave and the cotton trade lasted a lot longer than they thought. Okay, but the real idea then became keep it from spreading into the West. Okay, you, you, slavery would be confined to the to the not thirteen to the uh, Confederate states. I think it's a, uh, eventually it was eleven. Okay, and if we could if we could constrain it to the Confederacy, keep it from moving into the new territories, the new states, then it would it would die off. It would be isolated. Okay. Now, of course, the big fight in the 19th century, as the slave trade survived and the cotton trade survived and expanded, was the Confederacy kept wanting to spread it into the West. And this was the big fight. Now, the Missouri Compromise, which was already a compromise, and I forget the exact details of it, was, okay, anything north of Missouri is not going to be slave. And actually, I think it was anything west also. Okay. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act said no. It's what they called um, self-determination. In fact, what was the word that Stephen Douglas used for it? Eh, I forget now. Popular, uh, popular sovereignty. 
okay? Every st territory, as it came in as a state, would vote for whether it would be slave or not. So this led to extreme violence in Kansas. There were uh, literally gangs that went in and fought wars over, you know, who was going to uh, populate the state and which way they were going to vote. And people were killed, et cetera, et cetera. And then they realized that this was going to undermine the, the compromise and, and, uh, key, and, and that, that essentially in some form or other, slavery would spread to the West. Now part of what popped this off actually, which is of some interest or made it more intense, is when California came in in 1849, mm -hmm. the Confederacy thought that it was going to come in slave. And it didn't. Mm -hmm. It came in non-slave. I don't know exactly everything that happened out here on the vote, but that's an interesting reality. Okay, and that only hyped up the South even more to get it spread into some of the other territories. So that's the Kansas and Nebraska Act. And a lot of the argument by people like Stephen Douglas, while they may have been racists, etc., was self-determination, popular right. Every state has a right to decide its own future. Democracy. And that's when Lincoln realized that the whole thing was a mess. That and the Dred Scott decision. I mean, if you want a case where the Supreme Court was run by a bunch of no good bastards, it was the Taney Court. They ruled that slaves were property and had to be returned. And Lincoln saw that as, you know, that, the Kansas and Nebraska Act, that the country was headed for a breakup. All right.